Hello, it's Cherie, and welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. This is part six in the Mary Magdalene series. Before I get too far into this, because this is like super exciting to me, to the point where like I lose sleep at night getting excited to share these views and what's on my heart, what I've internalized as truth to my soul, uh, is that there is an upcoming retreat here in Utah, October 24th through the 26th. Message me through my Facebook community, Sheree Burton, Women Seeking Wholeness, or just email me, Sheree at ShereeBurton.com, and we'll get you on the list. Uh, we do have places you can register right on Eventbrite, um, and I will put that link into these show notes. But I wanted to tell you that a lot of the stuff that I have come to know as truth, and a lot of it is just strictly like, climbing and clawing and creeping my way towards what my soul hungers for and what I believe to be other souls hungering for that can't maybe put language to it. I believe in the power of events. I believe that events can shape and transform and literally shift people into a new way of looking at things. You could call it awakening. You could call it a, you know, a rebirth of sorts in terms of like, Hey, I got this aha. And I didn't just feel it or get it in my head. I, I didn't just have this happening as a new thought or a new awareness, but I actually feel something different. I feel like I've, I've put that ceiling into myself and I can now bust through and go to the next level that I need to in my life. I've seen the power of how events can do that. And so I have been doing retreats, workshops and events for gosh, about 15 years. And so I know and get excited about, that's one of my passions because I get excited about how women can transform that way. I hope that we do more of these kinds of things for men because men greatly need this. And uh, there hasn't been a lot of events for men that give them the safe space to facilitate their own awakenings, especially with emotional restoration and some of these more deeply um, spiritual or you know, neurological, I guess you could say more, uh, practices where they can go deep, um, and feel safe to do that. Sometimes they only feel safe to do that around other men, interestingly enough. So maybe somebody will come up with that. Anyway, I know Richard Ward does that. So if any of you are men that are listening, or if you, if you are ladies who have uh, a significant other in your life, or I know that I want to send some of my sons to Richard Rohr's event, his spelled is, uh, his last name is spelled R-O-H-R. He is an amazing uh, former Franciscan monk. I think he still has the title of priest, but he just does so much rich work around some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, actually. Um, just listening to the soul and breaking out of old false traditions and kind of listening to the voice within and honoring that. Um, anyway, he does stuff for men. He does a retreat for men. So I don't want to get too sidetracked. So anyway, if you are interested in that retreat, it is one of my Stand Speak Shine retreats that I do every year. And it's on embodying the divine feminine or the feminine divine. And don't let that freak you out. <laughs> Some people are like, what does that actually mean embodying that? I'm like channeling something? No, well, maybe, but no, it's a very gentle process of coming back into your soul. And actually the byline for the retreat is step into yourself. So it's not about outside influences or forces or manipulation or weird woo-woo, voodoo, mystic, whatever. <laughs> it's just, hey, who am I? Hey, what do I know? Hey, what am I struggling with? Hey, what's the one thing keeping me from fully being in my body, fully being here right now? Because honestly, that is the only thing we have. All we have is to be present with ourselves at any given moment in time. It's not about other people. It's not about our accomplishments, our resources, our possessions. It's about who we are, our own soul speak, how to tune into that and let that uh, manifest and appear for you. And, and it's very intuitive. It's very gentle. It's very personal and sacred. So all I'm doing there is just holding form for that. I am bringing in Amber Richardson, who is the who did the second in our series of Mary Magdalene, who will be doing a presentation, her beautiful PowerPoint presentation on Mary Magdalene and kind of bridging it from like the weird out there woo woo, because <laughs> there's so much written right to the corporeal, uh, the corporal true, um, I guess you could say embodied organic actual history. So fascinating. 
Well, let me kind of pull the series together for you. And if those of you who haven't listened to any in the series, um, you'll probably get a good synopsis with what I'm about to share. Um, but I highly, highly suggest that you take the several hours <laughs> out of your life to climb into some of those episodes because there's some meaty stuff in there. And, you know, all of the women that I chose are so different. And I did that purposefully. I was like, okay, we need a lot of voices. We need voices that aren't just American. We need voices that aren't just Christian. We need voices that aren't just, you know, one way to look at things that, because even though we all might have different faith traditions, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, ethnic backgrounds, gender, political, whatever, we all have the same universal need. We all just want to belong. We want to be heard. We want to be seen. And so I wanted these women who I've gotten to know personally, who I've looked in their eyes, I felt of their essence. I know of their uh, timely positioning on this earth, if you will, to bring this message forward, because it isn't just about Mary Magdalene herself. It's about Mary Magdalene's archetype, what that represents for women today and why it's relevant in our day and time. So this collective group of, of five women that I brought together, I felt like I had met in very miraculous ways, especially um, some of the women I met overseas. I met them in really miraculous ways. And I knew it was because they had a piece to my puzzle. And once I helped, they helped to facilitate that, you know, putting that piece in my puzzle of the ever ongoing mystery of the feminine, the feminine face of God, the sacred feminine, the divine feminine. Once they helped to facilitate that for me to a degree, I was like, oh, because it's my personality that once I learn something, I'm like, who can I tell? <laughs> I know that's a girl thing, but it really, for me, like I'm an absolutely relentless truth seeker. And I'm what I'm trying to do is extrapolate things into a digestible whole. So I can take a lot of different ideas and go, oh, okay, how does this fit with what most people know? And how do we come together and bridge that lack of understanding, honestly, ignorance that we've been programmed with regarding this whole divine feminine thing. And so Mary Magdalene just represents kind of this collective like, oh, where do women fit in the plan? Where do women fit in spiritual leadership? Where do women fit in spiritual authority? Where does the individual fit with that? Because it isn't just about gender. Uh, one of the things I've come to understand very powerfully is that within every single soul, within every person, and Christ talked about this actually, he talked about there not being a distinction between men and women in the next life. I can't remember how it was phrased, but it's basically along the lines of, you know, in the in the kingdom above or in the in the courts above, in the heavens or in the spirit world, or however we define that, there's there's no hierarchy. And it's not about a person's gender, it's about their own soul, it's about their heart. It's very relational. So within each being, within each one of us, we have the sacred masculine and we have the sacred feminine. And when we can reconcile those, not in perfect harmony, because we're never going to do that. A lot of it has to do with our environment until the environment truly is supportive of that and truly shifts into that as a whole. It isn't completely safe for both of those to express. And I believe this is why we have so much violence why things are at such unrest within humanity in all the systems and institutions, governments, academia, religions. It's because we haven't put those together. We're, we're literally missing half of the picture because we haven't learned how to honor the feminine in men. And we haven't learned to let women express that feminine fully either. And we don't know what it means. So this is just kind of my way, my quest to to put it together in my own brain so I didn't go literally insane. <laughs> and also just to satisfy this hunger in me to connect and commune with that hidden um, the, and the sacred and the, and the taboo. Because, you know, I'm just at a place in my life, let's be honest. I mean, if you listen to my episode, this is only the second episode of my podcast series, my whole podcast show that I've talked by myself. 
And the other one was about leaving the first half of life and that, what it's like to turn 50. But it's also a reference to Richard Rohrer's book, Falling Upward, where he talks, he, he, he delineates the first and second half of life. So the first half of life is all about structure and predictability and laying a good moral foundation and having that support there so you can become a good person and you can learn about how to be kind and compassionate and loving. Okay. And I'm really, really, really producing it, but I'm just saying, you know, this is in a nutshell where I'm at. So, but you get to a point in your spiritual maturation process where what satisfied you and what you came to know as truth and what felt aligned for you in the first half doesn't quite fit as you advance, as you learn more, as you gain more wisdom. Cause it's not just about like reading stuff and learning stuff. It's about assimilating it in your being and seeing how it rests with you. And so I had this restlessness and I'm like, what do I do with this? And uh, so it, it has created some crises, some little earthquakes with my long held traditions and beliefs. And it's been healthy. I mean, it's been hell, but it's been healthy as I'm honoring my inquisitiveness and my divine curiosity. It's helped me to come to a space of, you know what, I'm just going to give myself permission because if I don't feel that I'm given this permission, I know that's not coming from God. Because, because God made me this way. I have a critically thinking mind. I'm a relentless learner and truth seeker. And so I know he loves that about me and he's not going to shame me for that. So when I gave myself the go ahead, <laughs> because I did have to give it to myself and a lot of you will too, then you tend to not look at everything as like absolute. And that's part of what being in the second half of life is about. It's looking at things more paradoxically. It's looking at things as less absolute and it's embracing the mystery a little bit more. So things are not as clear cut, black and white, good, bad. Um, that's not to say that there's not immorality and evil because I, I know those things are real and true, but it's just not the direction I'm headed. Like I'm, I'm, I used to have this really strong fear of being deceived. I don't know if any of you else have felt that, but it's like, Oh my gosh, if I learn too many things that aren't like institutionally approved or, you know, right in the writings of like, you know, a, a committee went through it and approved it, like, or, you know, if this isn't generally accepted by mainstream humanity, much less religion, if this isn't a generally regarded, scientifically proved um, committee uh, processed or what have you, if, if this isn't in a textbook that is mainstream accepted, then, then I could potentially be very deceived until I used to believe that until I started to look at the history of people who became pioneers, thought leaders, spiritual activists, people who exacted planetary change. That is not the model they followed. They followed a different way of being and I remember listening, oh gosh, I forget her name. It's a really well-known lady who runs a podcast. I'll think of it later. But, oh, it's Martha Beck. So she, I don't know if she was interviewed. I think she was being interviewed on a podcast. I don't know that she actually has a podcast, but she is a New York Times bestselling author, really renowned life coach, um, very much an outside the box thinker and, and leader. But she, she was, I don't know if she was doing a documentary or she was putting something together where she was looking at some of the most powerful people in the world right now who are influencers. So when I say powerful people, I'm not talking necessarily about wealthiest or people who have a certain level of um, distinguished, you know, achievements other than they're just really powerful influencers and they're really helping a lot of people. So she looked at those people and she sat them down and interviewed them and one of the last questions she would pose to them was for this documentary, whatever she was compiling, like, okay, laying everything aside, what would you say was the most important piece to, br to bring you to where you are now, to where you are just like, whoa, entrepreneur, innovator, like you're just blowing it wide open. You're a leader. You're who you are. You've embraced that. You know, you're really helping so many people. What would you say is the one thing? And she said 100% of that's them said something along these lines. They said, okay. And a lot of them were like, can we turn the camera off? Because this is really sacred. So most of them said that. They're like, well, I would share the whole thing with you, but it's kind of sacred. 
Um, but it was something along the lines of they had some kind of mystical or spiritual marked experience or series of experiences that were not explainable, that they're not talking about, where they literally felt called into this work, the work they're doing. So they they put the time in, you know, they they cried and prayed and suffered. A lot of them had very traumatic life experiences, lots of trauma, lots of pain, suffering, loss, what have you. But the key for them was when they really answered the call of their soul, they were given a very pronounced experience that let them know they were on the right path and they weren't getting deceived. And this is what happened to me. So I will give you a synopsis of of kind of our last five parts to this series. And then I will kind of share with you some of my, I'm, I'm not going to dive too deep into what's really sacred for me because that's my own and I'm still processing it. But there were some undeniable experiences I had that led me into the work that I'm doing. Um, just a little bit of background of me on me because I know some of you are just new to me. <laughs> And you don't really know what to, to think of me or what I'm about. A lot of you who are listening are have followed me in other arenas. Um, I, I have been, I found a measure of success in the business that I do in natural health and wellness, essential oils. Um, I'm a leader, uh, a business leader of sorts in that. I've done a lot of mentoring over the years, traveled all over the world, talking on emotional health. Uh, and um, I've always been really of a spiritual foundation, very strong Christian. Um, My actual faith of origin is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormons, as they were once called. And, you know, even though I was brought into, you know, that religion um, from birth, I have always just been fascinated with other points of view. And that's why I went into psychology Um, So I would call myself more of a spiritual psychologist, if I had to think of a word for myself, spiritual holistic psychologist. Um, My my degree is actually in psychology. I also have a minor degree in sociology. And so that's been my kind of professional orientation is climbing around science. Because as much as I love spirituality, I know there's a quantum essence to it that's definable to some degree. Like it's quantifiable. It has matter. And so when we're talking about health and healing and wholeness and well-being, there's, you know, I've been studying energy psychology when as a closet researcher of energy psychology, because I did, it's the same reason I've been a closet fan and researcher of Mary Magdalene, because I was like, this is not mainstream yet, but I know someday it will be. So I've been, I was studying chakras before they were cool. Um, So 20 years ago, it was 25 years ago, I was studying about chakras, studying about energy psychology, because I just was so interested in it. And it felt like it would be true. With the latest resurgence of yoga and meditation and all these forms of going within and and being in your body, that always intrigued me. But I I actually took the 200 teacher training hours of yoga, almost completed them with my daughter this last year. And that brought me to a whole other level of understanding about the body. There's so much we don't know. And that's why it's so exciting. So if we don't give ourselves permission to venture into the lesser known, um, then we won't ever satisfy the hunger within. Now, in saying that, That doesn't mean that there's not weird stuff out there that I don't know where to place, okay? That's not to mean that I couldn't potentially uncover something that that I think is right and true, and it's not. But at least I trust myself enough, and I trust my relationship with God, Christ enough, and the spirit that I could be like, all right, well, I can take this part of that and leave this, but I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep, you know turning over this in my being to see how it fits. So let me just talk a little bit about what we've come to so far as you've listened in. Those of you who stuck with the series or bopped around in it a bit, great. Um, One of the, I kind of launched this off with Hira Hosen because, and she wasn't part of the Mary Magdalene series, but she is when I met, uh, she's from Amsterdam and I met, and she's lived in Egypt forever. In fact, we did our, our interview via Egypt uh, she, I met her in Glastonbury, England. I literally, and if you listen to that episode, the way that I connected to her is literally otherworldly. She was supposed to be in my life at that particular time. And it, and it literally is a miracle. I mean, I had 
I had sky miles I had to use and I always wanted to go to England. And I had this, this time to myself because my husband was taking the kids on a vacation with his family. And so I'm like, what can I do? Oh, I think I'll go to England. And where would I go in England? Oh, I'll go to Glastonbury. But I only had these three or four days that I could be in Glastonbury. So I booked my Airbnb in Glastonbury. And um, by the way, Glastonbury is kind of a, a rich area of the earth for goddess history, priestess, especially high priestess history. There's a lot of compelling evidence that Joseph of Arimathea, who it is believed to be one of Christ's benefactors, um, actually took Christ there in between the kind of the lost years of Christ. You know, we have his 12th year all the way to his 30 something year where we don't have any established history on him. But it's believed by a lot of the people in that area who kept these records and who passed down these legends and tradition. And uh, I guess you could, it's not really folklore, but they passed this down orally that and through some of their um, writings and historical monuments that that Christ was there and that Joseph of Arimathea was there as well. So anyway, it became also a place where even predating the time of Christ, we're talking in the early, you know, first century that they had these priestess temples and even predating the time of Christ. When I say first century, it went all the way back even to the Greek time periods where they had these temples and these places where uh, goddess temple worship was honored. And, uh, if you listen to my interview with Robin Young, she goes into the Egyptian history a little bit, but it was very well established with the early Egyptian documents that males and females had co-authority, especially as it related to teaching, disseminating information, authority politically. Um, the woman is shown traditionally sitting on like a throne. She, she kind of like, for lack of a better phrase, like she kind of rules the house. It has to go through her. She, um, she is holding the space for creation. She is holding the space for the governance of that kingdom. And you could say queendom too, but that is fascinating to me. So they have these places on the earth where um, this is well established that they had these ancient ruins and Glastonbury Abbey is one of the places that that's where I connected to Hera. So I found her there. She was one of the facilitators of an Avalon priestess pilgrimage. And I'm like, I don't even know what Avalon really is. I don't know what that has to do with priestesses. But this lady's picture is calling to me and she's doing a pilgrimage literally the exact four days I had already booked to be in Glastonbury and I was just, didn't have anything to do. So I think I'm going to sign up for her retreat. So happens she was co-facilitating it with Chloe Mercer who lives in England and um, is this beautiful yogi Rose Priestess, uh, who I also interviewed in the Mary Magdalene series. And so just with those two alone, uh, a richness was added to my journey, uh, a diverse way of seeing things because not only because they were raised in different places in the world and they had um, like Kira, for example, she lived uh, over a decade in a Zen Buddhist temple and her daughter was born there and she just has lived this am amazing uh, walk. She's an amazing divine feminine walk pilgrimage in her whole life. So she kind of started us off here about exploring the mysteries of the feminine and stepping into our own authentic vibration. Our souls have their own tone, timbre, and vibration, and we're not the same homogenized group. We are so different. I tried to picture Hira with her, you know, beautiful, um, she always wears the most amazing attire that's really congruent with her energy, you know, not just because she, you know, has the Zen Buddhist background, but just because she has stepped into like kind of this warrior wise sort of persona. And I try to picture her, <laughs> you know, she walks through the desert. She, she, you know, she lives in Egypt. She, all these things. Like I try to picture her sitting in my church congregation and what we typically wear and, and how conservative we are. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, wow. She would really not blend in too well and for good reasons. Um, but she has done the time. She's done the work. She's um, a master of meditation. So is her, her husband. Um, but just this whole, you know, mystic. And by the way, what is mysticism? I define that with um, Adamar, who is from Ireland, who is our fourth in the series. We talk about what is mysticism? 
you know, because I used to think it was, you know, witchcraft. I didn't know what to do with the word, but it's actually a Christian word. It, it originated with these monastic uh, communities, nuns and cloistered environments, monks, where they really wanted to have this direct union with the divine. They didn't want to just read about it. I mean, that's why they spent so much time meditating, but, um, as Christianity was beginning to be established as a legitimate institution on the earth, which was about, the, I think it was the third or fourth century, they really wanted to do away with individual people sort of having their own experiences. They wanted it to be, and I'm talking about the Catholic Church, and I mean no disrespect to Catholics, um, because a lot of them don't even know their history. Some of them do. But we went through, you know, Constantine, and we went through the Nicene Creed, where it was like, okay, here's the rules, people. <laughs> You know, you may live in this, you know, um, convent, or you may live in this monastery, or you may just be a peasant, or you may be out in the world somewhere. But here are the rules, and you must follow them, because there's no other way for you to reach spiritual enlightenment unless you do this. And part of it involved going through a priest, or going through a, another spiritual leader who had some kind of authority over you to get answers from God for you. And so these brave feminine mystics like, you know, Hildegard and Joan of Arc and Teresa of Avila, they, they were fearless in their approach to the beloved, what they call the beloved or the divine God. And it was like, hey, no one is going to keep me from forging my own connection in my secret chambers, in my closet if I need to in my heart. And that's what the interior castle is all about that Teresa of Avila wrote about. She's this beautiful Spanish mystic who just wrote about having that kingdom or what I like to call queendom inside of you. It has nothing to do with a church or an organization or an authority figure. It has everything to do with direct access. And so that is sort of, you know, when I was talking with Hera about this, you know, she and, and Adamar as well, Adamar, and I talked a lot about this in the fourth uh, of the series about how there's no hierarchy in spirituality. There's no hierarchy to God. Everyone's equal. Everyone's on the same playing field. Everyone has the same level, if you will, of divinity. It's just that they make different choices that direct them to a different lifestyle and hence a different way of thinking. Once they wake up to how they're thinking, they can do it a different way. But that doesn't diminish the diamond that is within them, the sacred source, the holy of holies, that everyone has that. So there's no hierarchy in this, in spirituality. It's only relational. It's only relationship-based. So even Christ talks about having, you know, I imply no servant at the gate, meaning, hey, it's just you and me. Let's just go together. And that is the highest form of revelation. It's being able to be in your, in your body, with your feet on the ground, doing that work and having that direct access. Because let's face it, you know, all the prophets, seers, spiritual authorities, mystics, um, gurus, yogi, masters, enlightened, whatever, elevated, <laughs> no matter who, how much they know or how even well they know you, they're not you. They don't stand next to you in the grocery store when your kid is screaming and they can't give you the answer you need in the moment. And that is the beauty of the mystical path, the mysticism just being defined as direct access and communion with the divine for yourself. So that's why I label myself. I'm self-appointed mystic because I just love that idea. And that's really been edged out of Christianity. So if you want a really good episode on that, um, listen to Adamar and I discuss that on the fourth in the series. When I talked with Chloe, um, who's the other one who facilitated with Hera when I went to the Glastonbury Avalon Priestess Pilgrimage, she talked about this whole thing about the Sisterhood of the Rose. Now, her episode is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> she speaks another poetic language about the divine. And so that might, I got a couple of messages. They're like, I don't really know where to place what she says. She's talking about galactic symbols and crystalline grids and matrices and other planets. And I'm like, hey, you know what? That is less important um, that you wrap your head around anything anyone's is saying to you and dive into like, how does this applicable in my life, if it is at all. And the reason I was drawn to her is um, I have always been fascinated with the rose. In fact, I, I named my company Blue Rose Wellness many, many years ago 
when I self-published my, um, a book on depression, I had um, a person who was really close to me, who was mentoring me in that process about starting a business and being a speaker and starting workshops. And she's like, well, you need to think of a name for your business. And so this is like 2007. I had just lost my sister to suicide. I was on a crusade to find answers for emotional healing and uh, break family patterns, gener- generational issues and things of that nature. So because I love roses so much and I didn't, and I know now why, but I didn't at the time, I was like, well, it needs to be rose something. <laughs> and then I was like, well, blue fits because blue is the color, color of nobility, but it's also the color of sadness. So blue rose, blue together, that's like uh, roses are naturally designed to be pink Um, There's no such thing as a rose that grows naturally blue. Um, Outside agent has to inject that with blue dye in order to grow a blue rose or to create a blue rose. So I was like, hey, that's how we are. We are naturally designed to be white or pink or, you know, whatever. We grow a certain way. And then these outside influences come in to inject us with foreign entities and foreign beliefs and all these things. So I was like, I'm going to name my company Blue Rose Wellness. Got it branded, got the domain, all that. So... My whole life, I've been drawn to the rose. And every time I would see a rose, I would be like, there's something there. I know it has to do with women, but I don't quite get it. And then when I started sort of on my mystical journey, I asked that I would be shown what it means for me personally, not for everyone, but just for me personally. So it came to be my own symbol of the divine feminine. And as soon as I saw it that way, it would show up and and it would like affirm things or be another witness for what I was learning. And, and it, it's also been a symbol of just encouraging me to keep going. So when I went to Avalon and I, and here is a rose priestess, I was like, what is that? So Chloe is this beautiful English um, yogi. She taught us these rose passes, just this, this uh, yoga poses that she has um, brought forward that are so beautiful. Um, she taught a lot in our, in the interview I did with her. I think she's uh I want to say she's like number three in our uh, six part series, but she talked about this, the circle of women who came to her after she had lost her young baby girl. And she was in such deep grief, but always being a seeker and always, you know, wanting to connect to the divine in her own way. Well, she was shown this circle of women, which she came to understand as high priestesses of ancient high priestesses who just surrounded her. And so she had her own mystical experience with kind of being initiated in her own way and in her own spiritual eye and her own being of going on her path to do what she does, which is very, very, very powerful. So the rose for her was a galactic symbol of ancient mothers. So I resonated with Chloe in that way because I don't have her same paradigm and I don't have her same language even though I honor her for what she has um, come to understand and know for herself. But she believes that G- that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were sort of like multidimensional avatars, is I think the way she phrased it, where they, um, they because they were here on the earth and they weren't just, um, they, you know, they're actual historical figures, that they personified for the universe um, in their bodies how to be sacred And so even though she had this different language around it, it's exactly the same thing that I've come to learn and believe that healing and alchemy in the body, being in nature, connecting to the earth rather than disassociating, that is what Christ and Mary Magdalene taught us. So her her episode is very interesting. If you want to climb into more of the, um, you know, I guess it's not really new age, but it's more of a different way of, of, collecting language around uh, sacred mysteries and, you know, even all of the grail stuff. I mean, you could go on an absolute bender trying to understand what is the Holy Grail? What is the sacred chalice? And all of that stuff is over in Glastonbury and it's quite fascinating, but just the soul embodiment. um, That is what Mary Magdalene's message is about. And it is why she was um, sort of put aside when Script, ancient scriptures were being put together and what should we include? What should we take out? Because we know now that she wrote her own gospel and that um, it's called the gospel of Mary Magdalene and it is written in her hand. But what's interesting is 
that it was not canonized. In fact, not only was it not canonized, but it, along with a whole other group of what we now know are the, what we refer to as the Gnostic Gospels, Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Thomas, um, and a couple of uh, Pistis Sophia and one other that I can't remember the name of, they were not included, even though they were written during the same time period. And so they were hidden. Some of them were destroyed. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene was ordered to be destroyed. But a group of, we don't know who, <laughs> the Hezekists know a little bit more about it. They're um, a group of, I don't know if they were desert dwellers or they had some kind of order uh, that honored these teachings. They took them and they buried them. And so there was more than one copy of them too. I mean, there, it wasn't just when I say Mary Magdalene wrote it. A lot of people believe it was an oral teaching of hers that people were writing down. And same with some of the other gospels. That's exactly how we got those as well. Um, and Christ never wrote anything, right? We don't have anything that Christ wrote. A lot of it is just his teachings that he passed down orally. So anyway, that's there were three different manuscripts that were discovered in Egypt of the Gospel of Mary, what we now know as the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, that were very congruent and dated to be written during the time um, that the other Gospels were written. But they were not discovered until the 1940s. As they say, they were actually discovered in an antique shop in Egypt, the first one, the first Mary Magdalene manuscript. But it went into, because of World War II, it went into a Berlin, what we call the Berlin Codex, where it was just held for a while because there was too much drama on the earth and it wasn't safe for people to actually bring it out or really um, translate it. So we didn't actually get the Gospel of Mary Magdalene um, until the 1950s. And then it wasn't exactly distributed. It still isn't that distributed. A few scholars have have taken on the project of actually translating it. My favorite translate, I, well, I, the Gospel of the Beloved Companion has a really good translation of it. I really like Karen King's Gospel of Mary Magdalene, um, her translation. She's a Harvard theologian, and she spent decades studying this gospel. And she is She's heavily cited and sourced everything all throughout it. Um, but what's fascinating to me about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene in the way that we have it, and, and Karen King talks about this, um, we get it through this antiquities market in Egypt, right? It went through, it was written in the Coptic language, which is well, actually it was written, it was composed originally in Greek. But it was it survived in the Coptic translation, and that, that's just an Egyptian language, um, Egyptian Christian language, honestly. So they call it Coptic. But how it survived and how it came forward when it did is very, very, very interesting to me. So once the once World War II was over, um, in 1955, we got that first printed edition of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene in a German translation. And so this tiny, it's what's so crazy to me is that this tiny papyrus that we have, it was um, fragmented. So it was damaged. Um, but when they excavated it, uh, it basically, you know, some of it, it's only 20 lines of writing. Okay. But some of it was missing. And for the other manuscripts that were found, that corroborated this, it, it, I guess it, they, they actually were found in different parts of Egypt, but they were very congruent with this, the main one that we use, that the papyrus that is used to translate on um, the main one. So anyway, as far as we know, the gospel of Mary Magdalene um, was never recopied after the fifth century. So it is one of the most pure, unadulterated it hasn't passed through a lot of hands. It hasn't passed through churches. It hasn't passed through um, spiritual leaders. It's just this rogue, like amazing text, sacred text. So it, but it dropped out of circulation and, um, and then was recovered. So even though it's very fragmentary, it's, um, it's, it's so 
miraculous to me that we have it and that not a lot of people are really talking about it. Why aren't they talking about it? Because, because it's not canonized and because no one started a church <laughs> with it. And, but it's so rich what we do have. And some of the most important parts that are still missing, which I hope they get recovered someday somewhere that they get discovered in ancient Egypt somewhere. Um, or in those er areas of Egypt where it's believed that Mary visited, it's believed that Christ visited, it's believed that many of the um, early influences to Christ were, you know, because Christ wasn't a Christian, right? <laughs> he was just himself. But the Christianity that evolved after his death was really influenced in this area of the world, Egypt, again, where they had goddess temples, where they did believe in co-spiritual authority or divine coupling. They did believe in giving women and men an equal footing in terms of gifts, spiritual gifts, dissemination. Um, you could call it prophetess, priestess, whatever. That, that was very accepted in those traditions, however, was not with the Roman uh, conquering Romans of the time. And so that did not prevail until this, um, I think it was just kind of buried until we were ready for it, ready for it to be translated the right way. And now I think it's ready for it to be more in circulation or at least more discussed because she, um, for centuries, you know, the master story really has just been focused on men. It's been focused on, um, in those first Christian centuries, all of these myths have sprung out about, um, you know, what's true, what's, what should be uniform, what should be, uh, you know, the way, if you will. And so it's only given us half of the story because we only have the male voice. And so her story again and again has really fueled more of a reformation in terms of, you know, what, what are the station of women? And, and I think it can legitimately change the way and the discussions and the narratives that we have around that spiritual authority. So I, I also want to say, and I'll get more into what Mary Magdalene means to me, but from a scholarly standpoint, it's all there. Okay. From a science standpoint, it's all there. Um, it is just as um, legitimate a text as anything that we have that's been passed down. Now, I know for people who, I, I really understand the like completely narrow focus of someone who's a true believer who's saying like the Bible is it. And it says right in the Bible, if you add to or take away that it's not a God or whatever, I don't know, that's somewhere in um, Revelation or something. Um, I think John said that, but that in and of itself was taken out of context, as is a lot of this, the scriptures that we have. So if we believe that there's more of the tapestry of truth for women, as opposed to just what we have in handed down, retranslated, um, extrapolated, taken out of context, um, you could say scriptures or ancient writings. If we believe that there's not a whole picture there, then we have to believe that there's more. And the more doesn't necessarily come from sacred writings. The more comes from what your soul is and your union with God is telling you, and they should align. And what's beautiful is when I really climbed into the gospel of Mary Magdalene and I looked at it with the biblical scriptures and even the Apocrypha and the Gnostic gospels, they all align. They are all basically saying the same thing, which is go to God, let him be first in your life, find out who you are in him or her, <laughs> I would add. And for not having the her bugged me, like just having my reference be male or patriarchal bugged from the time I was a little girl. And there's a reason it bugged. <laughs> I had to keep finding my way with it. So um, one of the other discussions that we had was um, basically about w with Robin Young, if you listen to the last episode, she and I discussed um, how a lot of the ancient mystics and prophets and spiritual way seers, if you want to call them that, both, you know, like everything from like Native Americans to, you know, some of their tribal elders um, to, you know, like the Druids and all the way back, Celts, all the way back. They're all saying that, that women 
hold, and even the Dalai Lama said this in his own way, that women hold the key, the key to creation. And creation in all forms, not just having babies. Okay, so I know a lot of women who will never have children. I have, you know, dear friends, and I have a sister, never had children, it doesn't matter. It's not about begetting human life, although let's face it, that's no small feat, and men haven't been given that. But when you edge the feminine out of anything, anything, then it's bound to be reformed. It has to, because that's literally half the story. So creation, the spark of life, the sustaining of all life, the vibration of light, um, the container of the world, the container of bodies. Um, this is part of the mystery. And, you know, there were, we, you know, if you really want to look at history, there's 26 churches in Rome that are dedicated to Mary, the mother of Christ. So they knew this and they had to keep Mary a virgin both Mary, and they had to make Mary Magdalene a prostitute to, to kind of show like, hey, <laughs> it's sexuality that defiles humanity. It's the temptress woman. It's, it's what she could represent. And it started with Eve. And, and so we know that some of that sacred architecture, sacred symbology, sacred geometry that exists is goddess-based. Um, all the way back, I actually, when I was in France on a sacred, on the sacred Mary Magdalene pilgrimage last year, I saw all of it firsthand. I saw literally ancient Roman uh, ruins back in the hmm, second century that depicted some of this. And, and it's just interesting to me that we've got to come back to that to bring more light to the world. We have to get our marching, our own marching orders from on high in our own way to bring forward um, the other half of the story. And, and that includes within our own being, not, with, not just with paradigms and social paradigms. So if you want to um, explore that a little more, listen to Robin Young and I talk about that because she's been on some of the same um, places of the earth that I have to look at the actual history. Now, when I'm talking about how does Mary Magdalene and Christ end up in Europe? <laughs> how do they end up in Egypt? Uh, it's all there. The, the writings are there. The, 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 um, the passed down oral traditions, it's there. Yes, there are some legends. It's hard to decipher what's legend, what's truth. To me, again, it comes back to the archetype. But there's a very compelling research that purports that after the cruise, well, first of all, there's compelling research that purports that Christ traveled a lot. And that he did so with Joseph of Arimathea, who was um, kind of a wealthy benefactor, who was, uh, if you read in um, the New Testament, was aligned with Christ in his mission and vision and was part of um, the resurrection as well in terms of like helping to get his body buried because he had the means to. He, he was insisting that Christ go into a tomb and tombs at that time were for wealthy people. And so anyway, that he was heavily connected with Joseph of Arimathea who um, it is also believed that Mary Magdalene is from the area Migdala, M-I-G-D-A-L-A. And she had a title. She was a woman of her own means. She had wealth. She had influence in some way. We're not exactly sure how or why, just like we don't know how Joseph of Arimathea did. But both of them, um, it is believed that Mary Magdalene was kind of a benefactress of Christ and was um, helping to further his mission and get it out to more people. She was a connector. She was an influencer. She was innovative. She was sort of an entrepreneur, both spiritually and materially. So she, she had also, um, it's believed that she would travel and that they were married. Jesus and, and Mary were married and that together they, they went on these pilgrimages or, or they sought out truth and whatever we want to call it today. I don't know what they called it then, but they would go to learn and they will learn these things together. And how can I make that leap? How can I say, you know, this, this is not just conjecture because when you go to these parts of the world, where it is believed that they were um, and that they visited to learn and advance in their own knowledge, they were going to the places on the earth that are the seedbed of humanity, like Egypt and places in Britain. Like I said, the Celts and the Druid and the places in England and Scotland and Ireland that just where humanity sort of 
um, we know that have had things like goddess temples and even the ancient pyramids, we know that these are predating the time of Christ by, you know, how many, how many years, right? So after Christ was crucified, uh, a group of his followers left for their safety, including Mary Magdalene. And it is also believed Mary, the mother and some of the other followers, maybe even Lazarus, uh, they left and they, they sailed. And it is believed that they landed on the shores of Southern France, which you think, how could France be ancient? Well, just Google ancient France. There's it's super fascinating, but, um, there were civilizations there in old Testament times, right? So they land in the shores of Southern France and there is a lot of rich art that depicts this because a lot of these, a lot of these truth tellers couldn't write it down because they knew that if they wrote it down, their text would be burned. So they put it into the art and they put it into the drawings that way they could kind of hide it. So if you know how to look with a critical eye at some of these ancient art pieces, you'll be able to see it all right there. So anyway, you know, Mary and a group of others, and again, this is this is so cool when you go to France and you go to these places and you see the art and you see the landscape and you feel the energy and you feel the spiritual uh, essence of those regions. It's very special. So I had to go for myself. <laughs> like, right. I'm like, uh, just like um, I had to go to, to Glass. I actually went to, to France six months before I went to Glastonbury. But um, both of them, those areas are very different, but they're very compelling in terms of the energy of the feminine. What, what do I mean by that? So because we all have masculine parts to us and we all have feminine parts to us, um, there's a lightness and a purity and a power to the feeling of the feminine versus the feeling of the masculine. And neither one of them are better than the other. They're just different. And so there's a... There's a real strong ethereal, organic, sort of pulsating power to the feminine that a lot of people don't completely understand. And I wouldn't have understood had I not traveled to these places. It's more than just a sweet, nice, beautiful, pure woman. <laughs> it's warrior. It's fierce. Um, it can be. And they all have their own archetypes, the feminine, right? There's so many. You know, there's Kuan Yin, the, the Chinese goddess. There's Tara, the Buddhist um, they, you know, there's just all of these ancient folklore around the feminine, all these different archetypes. Um, but for my intents and purposes, I was drawn to Mary Magdalene because to me, she represented someone who was at the feet of Christ working alongside him. And I wanted to understand why did he come to her first after the resurrection? And I wanted to wrap my being, <laughs> my whole awareness around like, Why? And if you, list, if you looked at my blog post yesterday on Facebook, I talked about this. When I was in my early teens, I, I remember somebody giving us this questionnaire. It was just this really like compelling question. And questions are powerful. Questions open. Questions are, so inquiry opens the spirit. Doctrine and absolutes constrict and close it down. Some, some doctrines are very expansive but dogma restricts and closes down. So I was already feeling that way as a young teen because we didn't have more about heavenly mother or how God it could be a woman or a man or, or I mean, sorry, not how God could be a woman, a man, but like, like why is everything always about men, right? <laughs> why do we just have priesthood stuff? Why don't we have priesthood, priestesshood stuff? And, and so I was already like processing that as a girl. So the question was, if you could interview anyone in history for an hour, if you could sit anyone down face to face from history for one hour, who would you choose? And instantly in my mind, my soul went Mary Magdalene. But that's not what I wrote down. I wrote down Jesus. And as I've explored that a little bit, well, first of all, my little teen self, like I think I was probably 13, 12 or 13, something like that was, um, oh, I can't write that down because if I write down Mary Magdalene, like people think that's really weird, but they wouldn't think it was really weird to like sit Jesus down. But for me, I wanted to know from Mary Magdalene herself, what was it like? What was it like to be with him? And what, why did he come to you first? And like, I could have interviewed her like, you know, Barbara Walters <laughs> and 
I've always been drawn to interviews. I've always been, I almost went into a career in journalism. That's why I started this podcast because I think people are so fascinating and she is the figure that I would have chosen. So I'm in France. I'm there. And part of my um, undoing at that time is, you know, and, and some of you know this about me and some of you don't, but at that time in uh, 20, 2018, 2018, I had um, filed for divorce for my husband a few months before that. And by the time I was on this Mary Magdalene tour or pilgrimage, I had decided to reconcile. And I have since a year later now we are divorcing. So part of my journey at that time was trying to drown out the voice of others and come into a space of what is the truth for me, not just with spiritual paradigms, but with my, my marriage, uh, the way I parent, um, the fa- kind of family culture that I want to uh, encourage or create, um, my businesses, my writing, And at the time, I had no idea I was going to be doing a podcast when I went on this pilgrimage. But I just wanted to get to the truth for me. And that was my path. And I somehow felt like physically getting on a plane and going to the area of what I believe, what I believed was calling out to me, that I would get some, I would get out of the cultural bubble I was in and all of the voices and people pining for me, <laughs> for my attention and for um, the things and my responsibilities and just go away and get clear. So I am currently going through a divorce and it's very conscious um, on both sides. It's very amicable And we're, um, I don't know when you would be listening to this, but for those of you listening to it in real time, um, we're now mid-August 2019 and um, are just ready to submit our mediation to the court as an um, uncontested divorce. And it's brought a lot of peace to me, a lot of um, sadness, but it's something I've been grieving over for literally years. So... My pilgrimage to France was part of the means to getting clear on what is next for me in my life and trying to honor Jeff's soul and his contribution to my soul's evolution, our sacred partnership, um, the covenants we made together, and how to make sense of what I was feeling, which was to, um, to move on. And even after the pilgrimage, and I'll just insert once, once I got to France, I'll, I'll explain what happened, but just to insert where I am now, not that it's any of your business, <laughs> but I am kind of an open book. I've kept this very close to the best. I haven't posted about this. I've said a couple things in different podcasts that have kind of largely been buried because I haven't felt the need to really explain to anyone because it's very personal to me and to my family. Um, but last year when we reconciled, I did post something about it. And Um, I posted that I was going to go back in and I was going to be all in and I was going to, and this was, um, you know, after on our 23rd wedding anniversary and it was after the Mary Magdalene pilgrimage. So keep that thought in mind because what happened, sometimes you can have a really powerful experience being in the moment with something and you feel to go a certain direction because it's the right thing to do by everyone else's standards. But what I have experienced is since I went on that pilgrimage, things have been falling out of my life that don't serve my soul's higher purpose. Okay. Some of them are beliefs. Some of them are people. Some of them are substances. I don't have, I don't have any addictions with anything other than eating unconsciously. Let's just say that. But my cell phone, um, the way that I show up on social media and the way that I share my soul with people that has completely changed. I no longer am attached to what people think about. I will always have an attachment to what people think about me. Um, I shouldn't put that out there. The attachment is more like I respect and honor people who maybe don't believe what I do. Okay. So I will, I have an attachment to that because I care about other people, especially those closest to me, but I'm no longer concerned with fake. I'm no longer concerned with platitudes. Um, soothing language around what's really going on. Uh, I now feel emboldened to call out distortion, whereas before I would like step around it. I'm really convicted now in my heart and soul about what 
being a woman means to me. And what being a woman means to me is probably, I know it's completely different than what being a woman means to someone else who's on the path of truth. But for me, I must speak. I must write. I must share. And it's, it's a commission I feel from um, my own soul that is in correct connected, um, connection to the Divine Mother and the Divine Father. So if you listen to my, I'll get back to France, but if you listen to my, my beautiful discussion with um, the extraordinarily amazing Sarah Beek, who she is so courageous to me and so, um, so embodied. I went to her soul fire retreat a few weeks ago and it just absolutely solidified everything that I had been thinking and feeling. It was more of a, a culmination, um, another added witness to what my soul was speaking. When you can have somebody show up and facilitate a retreat who is a Harvard trained theologian and also an author and a mystic in her own right to call in the divine feminine in her own way with her own voice. Um, I was like, yeah. So I, she was the first actually in the series. She was the first person that I interviewed in the whole Mary Magdalene series. And, um, you know, I want to, I want to talk about what Sarah and I talked about because it very much kind of moves into also like what happened for me in France. I didn't, of course, interview Sarah until a year after I was in France, but it's just the synchronicities, right? And you'll notice that with your life, there will be threads as you weave the tapestry of your life that um, you, you, you connect the dots later and you're like, oh, that's why that book fell on the shelf. Oh, that's why I was drawn to talk to this person. Oh, 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 oh. And in retrospect, like you look back and go, oh my gosh, like there really is a hand over my life to use Christian um, phrasing. <laughs> There's the, the hand of God is over my life. There's no question. I already knew that. I have had experiences in my life that solidified that. Like no one's going to ever take me out of that paradigm, right? That there's something bigger at play that's guiding my life. But what if it's your own soul too? What if God is working directly with your soul to guide you? And what if the self and God can be one? And I don't mean that in a heretical way. I don't mean that in a, a way to, you know, pay disrespect or be irreverent, right? I mean that in a sacred way. I mean that that is what Christ was trying to teach us. And it's all over in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the whole idea of going inside, going into the interior chambers of the heart. I'll get to some of what Mary wrote in a minute, but back to Sarah, because it leads into my France experiment. You guys got to follow me. You know that on my podcast, I go all over the place, but it really is going to make some sense, I hope. But Sarah and I talked about um, the Trinity of true love. So you think of the Trinity, it's all male, right? God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, because it's believed, you know, that even the Holy Ghost, a lot of people think, you know, the dove that descended um, when Christ was baptized, and it was a very feminine symbol. So some people believe that was the Divine Mother, um, that maybe perhaps the Holy Ghost is feminine or could be the Mother. We don't know. This is all mystery, right? I was trained to believe that the doctrine that I grew up with was that the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is is actually a spirit man, <laughs> which never really made sense to me. But anyway, all male, right? So, so what she brought forward to teach me that landed my soul very powerfully as truth was that the Trinity of true love is actually um, just as it is here on earth, mother, father, child. So if we look at that from um, an earthly perspective, Jesus and Mary Magdalene completed that Trinity of true love because they were it is believed they were married and that they probably had children, right? That's been excavated from a lot of our sacred texts, but there's so much out there that suggests that they did. Um, but anyway, if you look at it from a heavenly perspective, it's Father God, Mother God, or Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, or Sacred Feminine, Sacred Masculine, and us, right? So we are always the third part of that Trinity because nobody walks in our body but us. Nobody you know, goes through the universe, but our soul, like we are the only person we get to travel with. And so it just, it, it's just an interesting way of looking at that in a way that um, lands as true for me that it doesn't diminish the role of the Holy Spirit. Because what if the Holy Spirit is actually part of our soul? It's like already there, it's in. 
Um, Anyway, again, part of the mystery, and I'm not going to try to establish any other doctrine other than just sometimes when something's true, you know it's true for you. But she, Sarah, is all about reestablishing the Magdalene. So we know that this rise of the feminine, it's here, right? And it takes a male body and a female body. When we say the rise of the feminine is here, we're saying, hey, even the male body is noticing this rise in him of this feminine energy, this power, this beautiful, um, you know, it's the real Jesus, the real Mary Magdalene in each one of us. So developing that relationship takes us deeper. If we only looked at the gospel, a strictly a male disseminated, male led, um, male authority based gospel, how could that be full? How could it be in its fullness if we're not talking about and having narratives and really deep and bold discussion I mean, on, on women, on the feminine, and giving that spiritual leadership and that shared co-equal voice of, of authority. Um, and one of the things she said that I just loved is that um, energetically, what you're contending with is bringing you to discovery of those things. So whatever you're suffering through, and Richard Rohr speaks about this too, that whatever you're suffering into is ultimately your soul is always trying to bring you into a space of healing with the divine feminine um, and, and harmonizing the masculine parts of you and the feminine parts of you. I, I think I've always been pretty in pretty good touch with my sacred masculine. I'm pretty bottom line. I tell it like it is. I'm pretty achievement focused. I'm a producer, Um, so I, that's why business, I was always interested in starting my own business and growing a business and creating wealth in my own way, because I, I kind of think like a man, I know that sounds horrible. I don't mean that to disrespect either gender, but I think bottom line, I I get to the bottom of it. I get to the truth of it. I get to the, like, just tell it to me like it is and I'll do it. So the feminine is all about receiving the masculine is all about doing. So we need that balance. Um, I have also noticed about myself that as much as I have been clinging to and seeking after the feminine in myself, uh, you know, outside of me, right, through scholarly works, through researching and pilgrimages, I oftentimes disconnect from that feminine force within me. I mean, I have six children. (laughs) I, you know, if you walk through my house, you would definitely see some feminine influence, but I find that in my being, in me as a woman, I oftentimes disconnect from that. So the goal in life isn't to go to exteriors to seek that harmony. There's there's an actual creative force inside of you that seeks to harmonize the divine masculine and feminine together as one. And that is part of that beautiful trinity. And then um, with Amber Richardson, again, I will come back to France because this is where Amber comes in. So Amber Richardson is the um, was second in our Mary Magdalene series, and and she has be- since become just a dear little friend slash protege. I don't know, like we're both learning from each other because she's done a lot of feminist critical theory scholarship. Um, she's very smart. She's very wise above her years. Um, she's single. She's been through trauma, um, and she's come out on the other side just just this bright light. And she's a very thoughtful person. She's very careful and she's very selective in how she receives truth for herself and then disseminates it to others. But like me, um, she's from my same faith of origin, Mormon or Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But like me, she's sort of this like rogue and same with Robin Young. We're like these rogue, like researchers, like semi-closeted, like very careful and selective about what we share. So it's not to polarize those of our faith who maybe aren't on that same quest and wouldn't have that same thirst. Um, but it is our calling and we very much um, align that way. And, and Amber's been in my home and now she's helping to facilitate this retreat that we're having October 24th in Utah. But, you know, remember how I said at the beginning of this episode that a lot of the people who become woke, (laughs) as my kids would say, or who become thought leaders or poets or mystics or writers or um, thought leaders or whatever, and they just grow to have influence with people is because they had some kind of an experience when that happened to Amber. Um, she, She had an unexpected experience actually with Mary Magdalene and keeping it sacred to her and not wanting to 
cheapen it because sometimes when you put language to things, it loses its meaning um, entirely and people can take things out of context. But it propelled her in that sacred experience with Mary Magdalene and the color red, which shows up for a lot of people, the rose, the color red. Um, she was like, okay, I got to climb into this. And so she's actually doing a whole presentation at my retreat on bridging Mary Magdalene into more of a, um, organic, relatable historical figure, as opposed to just some like, you know, uh, yeah, left out of the story really in, in our faith of origin, as well as many others, I bet still women hungering for that. So that feisty, tempestuous, um, very kind of like sassy <laughs> part of my nature, Amber shares, but we both come from a thoughtful, sort of respectful place around not dishonoring what other people believe, but do not keep us from, from uncovering the truth for ourselves and for what we believe to be a hungering out there of other people who need that, that confirmation and that validation for what they are also feeling. Um, the basic theme for me that, that I came into right before I hit the shores of France <laughs> via the, the airplane, not the, not the boat, was soul sovereignty. That phrase kept coming to me over and over and over and over again. What does that mean, soul sovereignty? And I did not know that my soul was craving that. I had been programmed and led to believe in a very not in a nefarious way, not in a controlling or conspiratorial way, but just in a very like visceral way. Um, I needed to know, like, well, I say it wasn't nefarious, like with my church leaders or my parents or friends or teachers or any of my other authority figures. They weren't trying to hold me down consciously, but I had a rising within that started very, very young where I wanted to have my own authority for my own life domains. And fighting for that, and here I am now 50 years old, right? I fought for that as a warrior in my own self, had nothing to do with the people outside of me, but I had to claim that for myself. And I had to tune in and get crystal clear on the voices of others and the voice of my soul that is in co-creation with God. I had to delineate those two. I had to set a line of demarcation on what how I know the difference and what it came down to was soul sovereignty. I have to claim soul sovereignty. Um, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying a little while ago about like, you're in the grocery store, right? Like, where's your guru now? <laughs> or you're drowning. You d your boat just capsized and you're literally drowning. Where's your leaders now? Or you're in the middle of a dangerous situation or you're in the middle of a really miserable marriage. Those people, I believed, that were trying to give me very warranted um, and very kind advice, honestly, they didn't have to be married to my husband and live my life. And I use that as an example, not to denigrate Jeff, because he's a beautiful man. Um, and he's the husband of 24 years um, that we're not divorced yet. And we do have beautiful children um, that we are completely committed to parenting very consciously, hands-on, 50-50 or 100-100. But with that soul sovereignty, you know, ultimately you walk in you. You are in your body. You and God alone are in your body. That's it. Unless you're possessed of like all these evil spirits. Oh, but <laughs> which by the way, oh, the seven demons that got cast out of Mary Magdalene. Do you know, that's not the real story. Um, if you look at the Gnostic Gospels and you look at what was taken out before the Nicene Creed to be what we have as the New Testament today, and you look at the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, you'll find that those seven quote unquote demons were actually parts of her ego that she was expelling and that Christ was helping her and teaching her as her master to let go of. And it was very much an internal process for her that Christ helped to facilitate this is woven through all of the artwork in all of these ancient places, as well as um, in these Coptic uh, languages and this uh, text that we have. 
through the gospel of Mary Magdalene. Um, but I was always thought, well, why was she, why did she have seven evil spirits in her? So when I say soul sovereignty, I mean, Mary Magdalene is the organic divine feminine archetype of our day and time who was able to overcome the ego in all its forms. And, and honestly, uh, the person who drove that home for me most recently, I mean, most recently by like three days ago, I was learning from Megan Watterson, who was also Harvard trained um, theologian who went to the seminary there and made it her emphasis to study the divine feminine, both historically and um, not so much mystically. I'd say she's less of a mystic. She's more of a like, let's find, let's find the sources. Let's, let's, let's track down the history. Um, but she talked about these seven powers. And if you want to check out her book, it's called Mary Magdalene Revealed, The First Apostle, Her Feminist Gospel, and The Christianity We Haven't Tried Yet. Isn't that beautiful? The First Apostle, Her Feminist Gospel, and The Christianity We Haven't Tried Yet. I want to say something about feminism. <laughs> we are going to get to my trip to France, trust me. What is feminism? Well, it's not the angry picketing um, over masculinized sort of way of being that I think we've been culturally <laughs> programmed to see feminism as it can be that but feminism to me and I think to a lot of these um, scholars and mystics is feminism is a way of honoring that feminine influence or that feminine essence or that feminine energy it's a way it's co it's, it's about being co-equal it's about divine co everything, right? Masculine, feminine. Um, one is not above the other; they are equal, right? And I think that's really what they were talking about in Corinthians when Paul said, "Neither is the man without the woman, the woman without the man in the Lord." They were talking about this whole idea of equality. So feminism is just giving voice to harmony and giving voice to co authority. That's all feminism is to me. But anyway, Megan talks about these seven powers, darkness, craving, ignorance, craving for death, enslavement to the physical body, the false fence, the false piece of the flesh, and the compulsion of rage. So those were the seven levels of the ego. And you can read more about that. Um, but those are the seven powers that we all have as humans in us, as human beings, all of us have them. And they keep us imprisoned in our psyche. They keep us from... Um, full co-creation with the divine and they keep us chained and addicted and miserable. So when we're liberated from them, that's really what Christ was teaching. And that's what Mary herself embodied and also taught alongside Christ in a co-partnership was helping people to overcome these powers by going within. So when Christ said, you know, the kingdom of God doesn't come by observation, the kingdom of God doesn't come by outside um, it comes from within the kingdom of God is within, or, and he also said, ye are gods and what he was really teaching there. And I'm glad that they left that in the canon that we have in the new Testament. What he was really teaching there is, Hey, you really want to find God. You'll, it, the more you learn about God, the more you learn about self, the more you learn about self, you more, you learn that you are like God. They are comorbid. <laughs> That sounds like a horrible phrase, but they're this, they can be one in the same in terms of how we can live in this body, in this life. Suffering will always be there. Ego will always be present. The powers of those darkness, that, that darkness will always be there. But it's how we navigate through going within that gives rise to our true power. And I know this episode's going on a little bit longer. I plan to not edit a word of it. I just wanted to talk. I have a couple notes in front of me, but I wasn't sure what was going to come out. But I will say this. Undeniably, while I was in France, I got everything I asked for. I received um, some, some um, middle of the night type of undeniable, um, when I'm still processing, but very full and beautiful um, transmissions, which that sounds like, Hey, what is that? I don't know either, but that's the best language I have for it. Um, and like I said, it didn't come in language. So I'm, I'm still, um, processing and trying to disseminate and parse out what I received, but I want, I only share that with you, not because I'm claiming authority for you or answers for you, but it was what I needed to go to the next level in my life. And part of that was being a voice 
for the Magdalene. What do I mean by the Magdalene? The Magdalene is the archetype of awakening souls. It's people who who long to experience soul sovereignty, but who need permission to do so. Um, especially women, giving women a voice because we have for so long been silenced. And it is now our time to speak our truths and to get into our bodies. And I didn't know all of that on that pilgrimage yet. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be getting divorced. I didn't know that I was going to be going through a major crisis of truth in my faith of origin in the Mormon church. Um, I didn't know that a lot of the things that I held close to me were ego and that they weren't serving me and they were having power over me. Um, in a lot of my long held, like holding up the flag to be right and how I have harmed people and how I've been part of some systems that, you know, were really all about achievement and looking good and being right and that isn't the way of the divine. The way of the divine is much different. And so I wish I could say that at, that in that awakening or in those pilgrimages that I got it, like, and I just moved forward. No, no, no. This is, um, this is a very dedicated path to letting your soul teach you through God and being aligned with God and not seeing yourself as separate because you don't have the same authority as your exteriors or the figures who've been, who you've been taught are the people you answer to. And that's been quite liberating for me and also very, very, very painful. And grace has been a, another buzzword that comes through mercy. Um, I'm always open to being hundred percent wrong on a lot of things, but one thing I will never be 100% wrong in is soul sovereignty. I'm that sure of it. I've seen it in so many cultures now. I've traveled to literally every continent, <laughs> except for, um, uh, there's one, I haven't been to Antarctica, but I've been to all other continents and I've looked in the eyes of souls and I know we're all wanting the same thing. We want soul sovereignty. Um, I've seen African women in villages who are part of polygamous compounds. Um, I've seen um, FLDS here in my home state of Utah that are in FLDS that are in um, fundamentalist compounds, polygamous compounds. That's just that's just another example. It's like there's still there's still enslavement happening. There's still enslavement happening in government systems in academia. Um, I see it happening in my business. I don't want to be a chain to my business. I want to feel liberated in my business. I don't want to have to answer to someone else for how I manifest that business. Um, same is true for my religious path. I want to um, I want to look at truth as a huge buffet and realize that maybe we have a piece of a crumb right now on this earth of that whole buffet. And that maybe there are some things I can take on that buffet and leave other things and not have to accept the whole thing and still see it as beauty. And I'm still constructing that for myself. But in that process, I had to do a lot of deconstructing and uh, it led to a lot of grief and it led a lot to a lot of going within and having to continue to ask and ask and ask. So in that process, I've learned to just honor where other people are at and not have to make anyone believe anything I believe or come to know anything I know other than their own soul sovereignty. So now my retreats and events and the way I speak, it's all shifting into, well, what do you think? And I learned that that's what Christ did. Whenever somebody came to Jesus and asked him a question, he never gave them a direct answer. He never was like, well, let me tell you how it is. He either told a story <laughs> or he reflected a question back to them. So they would have to go within and figure out how that fits for them. Um, he was very much a revolutionary. He was very much against the prevailing authorities. He was always call calling out how those authority figures were missing the mark. He was always like, you know, he went to John the Baptist, this wild man to get baptized, right? And he was in the wilderness a lot and he was living a contemplative life. He was in communion with the divine before he stepped into his path and his mission the redemption of mankind through his example. And I believe that the more that 
we go forward in history, I think that we're going to start to honor that there was a woman walking alongside him and she was doing the same thing, but in her own personality and in her own way, she was teaching the kingdom within. And I encourage you to read the gospel of Mary Magdalene because everyone has their own experience with it. Like I said, it's only 20 lines of translated text, but it's very rich. And one of my favorite pieces of that whole thing is um, this idea of anthropos, which is actually a Greek word, but it means being fully human and fully divine. So this is where we miss the mark, I think, a lot in with religion and spiritual paths, no matter what the spiritual path is. We disconnect from the, the body because we see the body as the enemy, or we see it as keeping us from what we actually need to attain, which is an afterlife full of paradise. But actually, when we learn to work with the body, and we go through this process of reconciling the light and the dark and the paradox and the nuance, as opposed to absolutism, and we work with that mystery, we can be taught so much that transcends voices and language. We can be we can assimilate a lot more light into our being and we can receive a lot more truth, but not in the way that we're traditionally programmed, which is, hey, I'm going to stand up and tell you how it is because I don't want a guru to do that for me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need somebody to tell me exactly how it is. I think I do, but I actually just want that soul sovereignty. I want that liberation. I want to feel free to explore that for what that means for me. But this idea of uniting all of creation on earth and everything heavenly in the heavenly realms, angels, um, spirit guides, um, you know, all the disembodied souls, if you will, on the spirit realm, and then all of us here, you can bring heaven to earth. And that is exactly what Christ and Mary Magdalene were teaching. So Anthropos just means to be fully human and fully divine. And, and, and her whole, her whole concept, Mary Magdalene was about things don't come from us, meaning this, the spirit of truth it doesn't come from us, but it comes through us from within us. And I know that sounds a little paradoxical in and of itself, but basically what that means is we can actually access the source of everything inside of us. We ourselves aren't the source, but we can access it and we can't give it without accessing it. And this is where we see burnout happening a lot. Um, when we, when we run into a lot of checklisting and getting things done and doing things because it's the right thing to do and we miss the mark and it's to feel embodied, to feel soulful around it. Um, so bridging heaven and earth and setting up the space where you can merge the human and the aesthetic, the matter with the vision, um, the human flesh and blood with the light particles. So it's like metaphysical with physical to a degree. But that's part of the mystery is, you know, because you, this is why I was telling people to, to stay in your body because your body is the vehicle. You don't get there in spite of your body. You get there because of it. And we need both. And we need to stay in our bodies. I think it's so interesting. The year I was born, 1969, um, that is actually the year the Catholic Church renounced Mary Magdalene as having been at the penitent prostitute. So for all of those years, 1,900 some years, 60 some years, she was painted as kind of a whore who was possessed by devils and was taken in adultery and all these things. She was that person. Um, we now know that she's the woman, by the way, 1969 was the year I was born. So I, I, I'll, I'll claim that like, okay, wait till the earth. I can't come and tell Mary Magdalene's renounced as the penitent prostitute. But, um, you know, this whole idea of casting out what doesn't serve us and, and implanting within us what does. That's what healing is all about. And that's what releasing of those seven powers or those seven powers of the ego and claiming the purity of the body and learning how to subdue those powers in all moments of our life. That's really the core of her teaching, being inside, having spiritual sight. Now that's been mocked. Um, it's been downplayed a lot, but if you really think about it, how else could you be given divine truth if it wasn't coming from within you? Um, especially if we're talking about spiritual matters, which you can't see with the physical eyes. So having the, 
you know, um, having the wherewithal to go within and develop that spiritual seeing through the senses is stuff I've been trying to teach people. Olfactory, auditory, um, you know, sight, they're, they're all connected and they all bring us as pathways into the soul. So I've always had this real fascination with how do we get people in? How do we get them to the queendom within? So that part of us that's been missing from the Mary Magdalene's <laughs> script, remember I told you there were a couple of pages missing, is right the part where um, Christ was, sh- was teaching Mary how to really go within and access the nous, N-O-U-S, which is just a, a term. Um, I think it's a Greek term, but it's it's all about spiritual seeing or accessing or going within and operating and having that living dialogue, that constant communion with the divine. He was just about to teach her that and that part got ripped out. Isn't that crazy? Maybe we're still not ready for it, but hopefully that gets uncovered and it wasn't burned. Um, because remember the manuscript that was found was fragmented. So we don't have the whole picture, but that particular part, um, leading up to it was all about a dialogue between this is Mary reteaching it to the apostles. This is Mary reteaching what Christ had already taught her, which um, was all about going within, but that part got taken out. And just her whole messaging around the simplicity of the way we overcomplicate it because we, we divert our authority to exterior sources and therefore we never get to the heart of what we want, which is always a longing for love And we never access it because we're clamoring for someone else to give us that love. We never really learn how to go within and find it. And there's such a hunger collectively for human beings to hear that voice within. It's not just the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's you. It's your soul. It's it's how ancient is your soul? We don't know. That's another mystery. But you're not some dummy. (laughs) You know, you are divine intelligence incarnate. And so there's pieces of you that know the way. And it's in direct communion, of course, with God in that way. So we humans are the bridge. We, what I love, and and I'll kind of wrap it up with this. In my personal experience of understanding Mary Magdalene, having read, and I am not kidding you, almost every book that's out there on Mary Magdalene, I've probably read it. Um, I'm sure there's, I mean, some of it I've left to the side because it didn't completely resonate. And that's another disclaimer I need to say, even in my interviews and even in the women that I have brought forward to discuss this, I, I don't align completely with, with every single thing that they believe. Okay. That doesn't mean they're right and I'm wrong or I'm right and they're wrong. It just means that in my being right now, like that isn't true for me, but that person has a whole other experience and that's, that's for them. So I try to stay really clear on, is this expansive for me, for me? And is it causing uh, me to feel enlightened? And is it creating peace or curiosity? Curiosity did not kill the cat. I don't know who said that, but we need it. Curiosity is one of the only mechanisms that override fear. We have to have curiosity. So if we, if we don't, have any of you seen Smallfoot? Oh my gosh. I watched it for the first time with my kids in the dollar theaters during the summer. And I was just like, uh, um, okay. (laughs) That's basically a sweet little cartoon of my life where these established protocols and, and the little bubble and everything like that's what you do. Right. Um, that's anyway, I divert, I, I do, I'm diverting again, but Okay. So having a voice for me is important because Mary Magdalene's voice was silenced for so long. Her writings were silenced. Well, she didn't really write maybe, but her, her teachings, um, and her man, and you know, the incumbent manuscript that came from her teachings, um, very anciently were buried literally until 50 years ago, um, little over 50 years ago. And then also like just, you know, worst case scenario, somebody, um, you know, it channeled Mary and, and it's, it's completely like some weird off the wall person. Like there's so many ways she can come through. And so who am I to say that some, somebody is not channeling her? I don't ascribe necessarily to that way of learning truth for myself, but she will come in any way, shape or form that people will listen. As long as it's about soul sovereignty, as long as it's about directing us to God and going within. And in my 
That's my filter. I no longer am going to defer my authority. I will respect and honor other people who want to um, share truth and wisdom with me through their paradigms. And I will honor their station in leadership in whatever way, shape, or form they are in. But my leader is my soul connected to God. And this is the most powerful messaging that I received from studying Mary Magdalene from going. And there's just so much, you guys. It's just rich. The symbolism about the egg being the seed of creation, um, you know, uh, the legend about Mary Magdalene, you know, um, holding the egg because you see a lot of that depicted in the art because the saying was that she went before the le- the Roman leader at the time, whose name it completely escapes me. I, I want to say Herod, but I don't know if that was him where he was like, okay, well, um, if Christ was actually resurrected and if this, and if all this stuff is actually true, um, make that egg turn red or that I, I no more sooner believe you than to see that egg on that tray turn red. And so she started teaching and the egg turned red. And so a lot of time, and that's the legend, I don't know if it's true, but this is some of the, these are some of the, the stories that get, they get passed down through the art, through the ancient art. So you see the egg come up a lot and the egg also represents creation. But this idea of power and intensity in the present moment, um, being a voice for the voiceless, um, not being silenced anymore, not silencing your feminine spiritual gifts. These are all things that I believe now are necessary for the evolution and the advancement of our planet, for humanity, for the healing of the earth, which we could talk a whole thing about the earth because being in nature was another thread Um, that I heard time and time and time again, not just in the Mary Magdalene series, but the other people that I've interviewed and met over the years and traveled to explore different regions of the earth. It's the connection to nature that's going to heal us. It's getting our feet in the earth, um, using um, substance of the earth, um, communing in nature, the sun, the wind, the soil, the elements, all of those things are ultimately where, what are going to bring us to a state of wholeness. And so Mary Magdalene definitely was that organic feminine embodied um, of the earth, if you will, because she walked here and she's the closest thing that we have right now to what a goddess would be. And so we can't edge her out anymore. And if you're feeling in your own heart and soul that there's something there for you to explore, it might not be that Mary Magdalene is the archetype for you. It might be that you need to go and study some of the feminine mystics or the scholars or the saints or Oprah or Maya Angelou or Brene Brown. There's so many ways that this can come through. Um, Mary Magdalene's archetype is not my only one. I love Joan of Arc. I love a lot of those, um, you know, Julian of Norwich and Teresa of Avila. And maybe I can bring in, I I took a whole course on feminine mysticism when I lived in New Zealand. I took a virtual course and oh my gosh, so much, so much. And how courageous and how bold these women were. And they all got burned at the stake, pretty much all of them, for only saying, I cannot deny I cannot, you can go ahead and crucify me. You can burn me. You can do whatever you want. I cannot deny that this is what my soul knows to be true. And um, so maybe we will revisit some of those stories as I go along in the podcast, because I think that's how we learn. We learn through, largely through experience. That's how we can gain our soul voice is through suffering and through these um, rites of initiation, if you will, through trauma that we've walked through. All of us have walked through hell. So you come out on the other side of that and go, no one can take away from me what I know to be true for myself. And when enough people, (laughs) mostly women, I will say, when enough women come to that understanding for themselves, we will have a different world. Depression will start to melt All depression is, honestly, I mean, there's a lot of things that exacerbate it, but the true cause of depression is disconnection, just like the true cause of addiction is disconnection. So if enough people start to connect back in and start to learn what it means to listen to their soul voice and then honor it, irregardless and irrespective of the fallout, they're willing to walk through that. So courageous. When enough people do that, we will have a groundswell (laughs) of power that happens that can be really transforming. It's happening already. It's happening in a lot of countries, um, a lot of religious structures, the government, the Me Too movement. Um, But it was so 
um, inflamed and so burning, so such a burning within me to the extent that I had to now start a podcast. So now you know, <laughs> now you know the context and background of why I started this podcast to begin with. Because yes, I I speak in some spiritual settings. Um, and then I have that conversation, right? But then I talk about business and then I have that. And then I talk about, you know, biochemical science and I speak in that domain, but never have I brought them all together, even though they're all pieces of the whole me. And now I'm starting to learn that they're very, very interconnected, the alchemy of healing related to connection. I'm developing a creation compass. Some of you know about this already. and You've heard me teach and train on it. A 16-point creation compass rose that I'm in the process of getting trademarked. Um, I'm writing about this now, and it's all coming together for me. So I just, my shout out to you is to find what lights you up, to what lights your soul up? What illuminates you? What what's um, what's the divine flashlight shining on right in front of you? And stay embodied. Find ways through breath and connectivity to stay attached to your body because that is your vehicle for empowerment. And just know you're not alone. <laughs> you know, um, if you need further validation, keep listening to these podcast interviews because there are plenty of us waking up to this, these truths. And it's not an angry movement. It can be warrior-like and it can be fierce, but it is in no way disrespecting unless it needs to call out injustice. And then it will. But for now, it is gentle, it is peaceful, it is purposeful, it is intentional. And the intention being to bring people back to their own souls. So thank you so much for listening to me (laughs) just ramble. And... um, stay connected to me through Facebook. I have some cool things happening. I actually have a year long program that I'm bringing to to pass what I call the year of the woman, which is 2020. So January of 2020, I'm going to start a year long mentorship in a group mentorship. So more to come on that. I'm also studying, um, setting forth an intention to do all kinds of mentorships, memberships, retreats. So thank you for your time. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for listening and for showing up. And remember, If you long to feel expressed and be who you were created to be, this is your permission to be that, to explore that and to do that. Have a beautiful week.